we continue our series, Meaningful Life. I've been asked to speak on a topic, True Pleasure. And uh, the text can be taken from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, from verses 1 to 11. Ecclesiastes, chapter 2, from verses 1 to 11. And I just read that. It says, I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless. So I said, laughter is silly. What good does it do to seek pleasure? After much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine. And while still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. In this way, I tried to experience the only happiness most people find during their brief life in this world. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks, filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my many flourishing groves. I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. I also owned large herds and flocks, more than any of the kings who had lived in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of silver and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. I, I got into the university at the age of 17, <clears throat> excuse me, which was the average age at that time, really. And um, I had been to the university a few times before I got in there. So I was kind of familiar with, you know, how they run things there, especially on the social side, but not necessarily on the academic side. So I was just a bit curious just to see, you know, because I had some friends who had gone before me there and they came back saying something 101, 121, I thought, what's, what's all that? You know, uh, uh, so when you get there, you know, you know. So I was a bit curious just to find out what you know, the academic side was going to be like. So we got there, and um, what I saw wasn't what I was expecting, because I saw quite normal people my age, you could tell. A lot of people who are slightly older, maybe two, three years older. And I saw a bunch of people who are a lot more older. And I thought, hmm, okay, this is a mix. Um, but there was a guy in particular that, you know, I just, you know, spotted him. I think because of his dressing, he came in a safari suit. I don't know whether I know what a safari suit is. I can't describe it, so don't ask me. It's not a long suit, it's a short suit. And the lecturers too were wearing safari suits. So he came well prepared. So I was just, you know, a bit curious about the guy. And as time went on, you know, he built a followership. You know, other people would, you know, uh, hang around him. Um, he would sit in front, you know, and uh, very good at answering questions. And for people like us who weren't really there for the education anyway, we didn't even know what we came there to do. You know, uh, he would ask questions from the lecturer, you know. And when we are thinking, okay, this thing should be finishing now, 
the man is still, you know, asking questions. Let this man go. Let this lecturer go. You know, but little by little, I saw that he wasn't going to stop. He became friends with lecturers. He will go to the lecturer's office before the lecture starts. When the lecture finishes, they will walk the lecturer back to the I'm thinking, what is it about this fellow? If the lecturer is not going to come to class, guess who they are going to you know, send the message through? Him. So I watched it until I found out that before he came to university, he was employed. He had worked somewhere in uh, Lagos. He had worked in the Ports Authority. <laughs> so I said, this guy is not, definitely not in my league. You know, you know he, a lot of experience. But as I grew older, I began to realize that the approach that this guy took, I think it was a better approach than the one I took because he was a very serious person. Not that we spoke because, you know, I just looked at him at arm's length and uh, but I kind of studied him, you know, very punctual, you know, when the lecturer is, you know, extra lectures, we are saying, no, we don't have the time. The man, and he's very, very, he's got a very deep voice. So we'll come. So I told my friend, I said, is there a prefect in university? <laughs> in secondary school, they do these kind of things. But that was the kind of person we're dealing with. But I kind of started to see that hmm, his approach is a lot better for so many reasons. Very serious at what he came to do. Very, very serious. And I found out that in life, life is for learning. That's what life is for. In fact, some people say that they call it the university of life. That's what they call life. So our approach to life must be like those guys, the guy I was talking about, very serious about life. I find out that in life, like the universities, life also has a date of admission. And it has a date of graduation. But we don't have control over those two dates because those dates are set by other people. In our own case, in life, it's set by God. The only time we have, or the only control we have is in between the date of admission and the date of graduation. So how we spend our life in between is down to us. As I said, I was in the university, I wasn't, uh, I looked at it again, I just thought, I don't know how I coped, how I you know, passed through the place. Because I went there, because everybody around me, you know, it, it was the norm to go to uni. I remember, you know, I got there once and I spoke to a few of my friends who were all together. And we just thought this wasn't working for us. So we packed our bags and we took off were in Lagos for weeks, you know, put ourselves in the hotel, not minding what was going on. This was term time. And it helps you to now think that, why were you there? To be honest and to be candid with you. Maybe it's a young man's thing, I don't know. I thought I was in uni because of my parents. I thought I was there because of them. So I didn't really care. I didn't own the thing. I didn't take responsibility. But you know what? In life, we have to take responsibility. We are living this life for ourselves. Was I studying for my parents? Of course not. But then it, it felt like I was doing it for them. Looking at life, 
we owe our existence to God. He is the one that sustains us. He is the one that maintains our cause. The Bible says that it is by his mercies that we are not consumed. In fact, God woke us up this morning. Without God, we won't be here. I'm sure you, don't know, you know that it's not your alarm that woke you up. It's God. So if we owe our existence to God Almighty, then there's a reason why God wants us to be here. If it is by his breath, we've just been singing about it now. There's a reason why we're here. There's a reason why I was sent to the university where I went to. That's the reason. Now, why are we here? Why are we here? You see, we are here to give God pleasure and not pressure. No one can give God pressure anyway. But we can get him angry. But basically, we're here to give God pleasure. And Revelation 4.11 makes it very clear. It says, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. You created what you pleased. So we are here to give God pleasure. But sin, disobedience, I'm using so many words to qualify it now, is the problem. Sin, disobedience, has caused a wedge, has caused a separation between us and God. And, you know, for people who probably in management, if you have somebody in your office that is constantly flouting instructions or flouting directives, you know, directives given in line with company policy, what do you do with such a person and is constantly doing it? Do you say to him, darling, darling, is that what you say to the person? Or you report them to the local police, HR? What do you do? So if we cannot take rebellion, why do we think that God can? So that's the challenge that we're faced with. But we are here, let's not forget, we are here to please him. That's why we are here. So how can we please God? How can we please God? The way we can please God is to make our hearts right with him. That's how we can please him. And how do you do that? To make our hearts right with him means that we first of all must accept that we are sinners and that God is true. You know, let's, you know, I hear people say things like, you know, I'm a good person. Please, let's drop that. Nobody is good. Let's, let's, if anybody is telling you that, don't listen to that. Acknowledge that we are sinners and genuinely repent of our sins. Just means say to God that you are sorry. We've done so many terrible things. Though. 
And the law of the land, no matter how you beg them, no way, that fine is coming. The fine is coming. Depending on what you have done. But God is saying, all you have to do is just to say, look, I'm sorry. Just genuinely repent. He's not asking you to go and call the, the local council. He's not asking for that. Between you and God, just where you're seated, you can do it. He just wants the genuine repentance. How good can that be? So God wants us to repent. We repent of our sins and then we put our faith in Christ Jesus, who God sent to die for our sins, to pay the penalty for our misdeeds. But you see, putting your faith in Jesus also means that you are going to follow him and obey him. That's what it means. You are going to follow him and you are going to obey him. And when we do that, we become followers of Jesus. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus is sent into our hearts. And the Holy Spirit does a lot of work. But one of the key things that the Holy Spirit does is that he helps us to get rid of self. It turns the attention from us to God. Naturally, by default, we are selfish people. It's all about us. But when the Holy Spirit begins to live inside of us, he gives us a change of heart. And then we begin to live for God, to please him. Romans 2, 28 to 29. That, if you please help us put it on the screen, that helps us. Romans 2, 28 to 29. It says, for you are not a true Jew just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you have gone through the ceremony of circumcision. No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart. A change of heart. A change of heart produced by the Spirit. And a person with a change heart seeks praise from God not from people. In other words, a person with a changed heart now lives to please God. You see, it's until our lives begin to give him pleasure that we can also experience the true pleasure. And he is the source of true pleasure. It's only until that happens that we can now get that exchange in return. And Psalm 16, verse 11, puts it very clearly. Uh, maybe you might want to put it. Thank you. It says, you will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. You know, in the world that we live in, the world that we live in is very, very unsettling. I don't know whether you feel that way. A lot of things are not right. And I don't know how people cope who don't have a relationship with Jesus. Because anything can go wrong at any time. But the benefit of this is that when you become a child of God, you've got back up. You've got God with you. And there are many things that God does that man cannot do. You know, the, the list is endless. But just to talk about this joy and peace. And you might not necessarily value these things until you find yourself in a tight situation. Peace and joy, they go hand in hand. And it is only God that can give this. The world is running helter-skelter. There's no peace. And if there's no peace, there can't be joy. 
because they go hand in hand and it comes from God. Recently, I've just been thinking and I said, this world cannot be the real thing. The Bible says it, but you know at times the Bible says something, you're also using your head to process. It can't be. The world is in chaos. And God says that he has prepared a home for us. This is not your place. Though. This is not a permanent place. You shouldn't sit down here and think this is a permanent place. We all should be longing to make heaven. Because every day, things continue to get worse. Eternal life is something that you cannot afford to miss. We can't. And that's what God promises. He says, whoever has the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have eternal life. This world is in chaos. My brothers and sisters, all is not well. All is not well. There's confusion, there's pain, there's trouble everywhere. But come to Jesus. Because in the midst of all the trials and in the midst of all the pain, God can give you peace. And he will give you peace. But you've got to come to him. You've got to surrender to him. It leads me to the man Solomon. We started with him. The first verse of that Ecclesiastes chapter 2 sets the tone for the rest of the, of the passage. Because that's where I think the clue is. And I'll just read that. You know, just the first verse. A bit of the first verse. And then we'll look at it. He says... I said to myself, that's the first thing he said, come on, let's try pleasure. Let's look for the good things in life. The first thing here is that a man who is a true follower of Jesus does not seek after pleasure. You seek to please him. He, in turn, gives us the pleasure. We don't go around seeking to, you know, for pleasure. Like I was doing in uh, uh, my university days. I got into uni. I didn't know what I was there for. Just gallivanting around the whole place. He says... I, I said to myself, come on, let's try pleasure. Romans 2 that we just looked at makes it clear that when you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, it's about pleasing him. You seek to please him on a daily basis. And God knows how to sort you out. But we don't seek after pleasure. Now, nah. Then what pleasure are you looking for again? The source of true pleasure is your God. Remember he had some, you know, when he, his father died and he became the king, remember the story? And he sought after God and God blessed him with, even the things he didn't ask for, God blessed him with it. How come now you are looking for pleasure? What pleasure are you looking for again? The source of true pleasure is your father's God. You know him. Then he said, let's look for the good things in life. There is nothing good outside of God. Nothing. Outside of God, there is nothing. Let's look for. In other words, what I, say, what I think was going on here is that Solomon had stopped following God here. He had stopped 
following God. I know many times we too, we get into that zone and we're trying to justify things. Then he's looking, he says he's doing research on madness, on folly. Who sent him on all those things? All those expeditions he was going for, he measured this, he measured. Who asked him to do that? That's not God. Pastor preached here some, I don't know, about two or three weeks ago, about a thousand women that he was dating, or married and concubines and whatever. How do you cope with that? No wonder everything came back as meaningless. Zero, zero, zero. <laughs> because he went off the radar. He went off the radar. He wasn't following God again. I said to myself, let's check out. So it's a very thin line. Very, very thin line. For someone who, you know, had an encounter with God and all of a sudden he's now looking for a substitute. The question now is, Solomon, we've talked about him. But how did he get to that point where he was looking for pleasure elsewhere? He was looking for the good things of life outside of God. He had replaced God for other things. What are the things that we need to take into consideration so that we don't be like him? Because, you know, many times I used to think, oh, you know, 700 why 300 concubines? That stands out, and that's you know quite excessive. <laughs> it is excessive, or am I saying something? <laughs> it is. It's excessive. But I find out that that's his territory. Other people have different territories. Other people have obsessions in different areas. So before we talk about Solomon, I want to check myself quick, quick. I want to check myself out quickly. So what can we do? The first thing is that we need to be disciplined with our time. I don't know why time keeps coming up and it's not planned. It's not planned. I don't, I don't know why. Every time, I, I just time, 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 time. I don't know why. Let's be disciplined with our time. Those guys in my uni, 15 minutes to the lecture time, they're already looking around. I said, what's wrong with these people? It's good to be super efficient, but over efficient, I don't know about that. But now I know better. Let's manage our time properly. So many things that he went into, this Solomon, that he need not. You know, talking about the 1,000 women, it takes time. If you have one wife and three children, <laughs> God bless the wife, so I'm not, so I don't enter into trouble when I get home. But it takes time. You, you know better than I do. But to have 10, 100, 1,000. And I don't know how you coped with time. You were still able to do so many things, but let's manage our time properly. It's very, very important. Don't forget we said that admission time and graduation time. And once it's time for graduation, it's time. You don't have any control over that any longer. And then they, they, they assess. Secondly, is that live by faith. Which means that we must continue to follow him. He stopped following. He stopped 
following. Live by faith. And Hebrews 10, 38 says, And my righteous ones will live by faith. But I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. I will take no pleasure in anyone that turns away. It's a work of faith from beginning to the end. So we have to keep following God. We have to keep obeying him. And the last one, Proverbs 4.23, it says, above all else, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. God bless you.